Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here today with Pablo Fetter. Uh, Pablo has been a fund manager for a while. Could you please introduce yourself, Pablo, in a couple of minutes and tell us who you are and what your uh, experience and expertise is? Yeah, so my background, I'm an engineer and my background uh, what I've worked for uh, for over a decade or almost two decades is in, in investments in general, in venture capital, private equity um, and investments for, for corporates. And um, I have uh, developed a, a certain you know, interest in, in the stock markets. Uh, so I am quite... Uh, focused on, on investing in stock markets. And that uh, would be roughly what, 15, 20 years about? Yeah, so I, I started with uh, stock markets, uh, I started looking at, into, into stock markets in actually in 1998, which is exactly mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and lived through, uh, you know, a, a bubble and the burst of the bubble in 2000, 2001. Uh, the recovery throughout the, the, the first decade of uh, the century and then uh, the great uh, uh, recession uh, and then back, back to where we are now. And I also started trading in 1998. Oh, is that right? So same year. Yes, as a PhD student, okay. the dot-com telecom bubble, some yeah. of my buddies were trading, so I used some of my uh, fellowship which I had in the stipend, yeah. which is a scholarship which I used as uh, training. All right, so you're mostly in uh, stocks. And we have, from, from uh, my general feeling is that stock market is again in a big giant bubble practically everywhere in the world but mostly the u.s stock market i feel is grossly overvalued with valuations comparable to 99 and 29 again it doesn't mean it can't go a lot higher but uh, uh, again, how do you see the stock markets around the world, or at least those that you're familiar with in terms of valuations, and then try to see what will, how do you see the prospects of the market? Probably we've got to delineate short term, mid term, probably long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, so first of all, uh, you know, I train, I trade my own money. Mm -hmm. uh, so, my opinions basically are the intellectual underpinning of what I do uh, and not I'm not an advisor I don't write newsletters I don't I don't try to convince anyone uh, so I don't have a kind of an agenda which goes beyond my own trading um, what I think is very important is what you mentioned you mentioned you know different time frames and my, you know, if you ask me, are you a bull or are you a bear? Yes, are you uh, a bull or a bear? Are, are, you, are, you, you know, are you optimistic or pessimistic uh, about, the stock market. about the stock market? My answer is, it depends. Uh, okay. I am, uh, you know, very bearish in certain time frames and very bullish in other time frames. Well, we so let's, let, let's, 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 let's go through that. So first of all, very long term, so when we're talking decades, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a raging bull. Uh -huh. Over the long run, I think that one thing that stocks do is they go up, right? Over the long run, they simply go up. If you look at, for instance, uh, this very interesting bet that Warren Buffett uh, went into in 2008 or 2007, I don't remember exactly, uh, where he said over the next decade, 10 years, the bet expired just recently. Yes. Um, I challenge any fund manager, any any uh, hedge fund manager, uh, to uh, you know to bet against me for you know who, who which market performs better, either the S and P five hundred index, including dividends, total return, mm -hmm. or. Uh, you know any any hedge fund or any group of hedge funds mm -hmm. somebody took the bet i forgot the name of the gentleman and yes. he was a, 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 a manager of a, a 
fund of hedge funds, so basically a group of yes. hedge funds. He chose what he thought was the were the best hedge funds yeah. in the world. Yeah, the best of the best. The best of the best. Uh, and over a 10 year period, as it turned out, the S&P 500, including dividends, total return, absolutely destroyed. Outperformed, yes. Completely outperformed the, this group of hedge funds. And if it would have been other hedge funds, it would have most likely also outperformed. Been there, okay. After fees and everything. So that shows, I think, very clearly that basically stocks in a way over the long run, over decades, they basically, if you, if you buy stocks and hold them for, for a long, long period of time, you're, what you're betting on is human ingenuity and the ascent of money, if you will, right? So, right. so it, it's something that is, you know, over decade over decade, stock markets have performed uh, Overall, Paul, how yeah. would you argue if somebody bought, you know, the classical example is 1928 and 1921, yeah. wouldn't the long run until yeah. 1954 be too long just to came back yeah, so to the, come back to zero um, um, of course if you if you take one particular you know the worst time ever the day before uh, the, crash. The, the crash or that that usually leads to longer drawback uh, drawdown periods where you know people have to wait long for the market to recover um, Obviously, you can choose much more points yeah, along, the more way, points along the way where the draw, maximum drawdown period was much shorter. But even if you take those, eventually you come it out of the back. Yeah, eventually it comes out. It comes back. But it, you know, so obviously, if you if you choose the worst time ever to invest, uh, that that is going to lead to a, a longer waiting mm -hmm. time until you recover from from the drawdown. But um, so the question is how, how long is that period, right? So going in a very long term when you're talking decades, there is, I think, it's very clear that you can't be anything else but a bull, right? Over a long period of time. Well, the question is, obviously over the long time, over the long term we're all dead, as, as we all know. Uh, the question is what, is what is a very long period? What is just a long period of, of time? For me, when I talk about um, a more, uh, you know, a short time period that is not very long, it's not decades, but we, we, when you talk about years, mm -hmm. um, I think that the, so that there is a realm where you, where you historically have had recessions, you mm -hmm. have had uh, bear markets, and arguably, you know, we haven't, we haven't had a recession for quite some time, and we haven't had a bear market for quite some time, so at some point in the future, yeah, in, probably in, in me year, measuring, probably. measuring years, okay. uh, there will be another recession, there will be another bear market, there will yeah. be crisis. Yeah. Um, so so that, that, is, that is very clear, right? That's uh, very clear. You accept that. Uh, that is very clear. So if you ask me in that kind of not very long term time frame, but simply long time frame of uh, you know, a year, two years, three years, I would say I would, I'm cautious. Do I know whether there's going to be a recession or, or, or a bear market in that time period? It's likely. It's likely, uh, simply if you look at the historical precedent, it is likely that that, that uh, will happen. Now, is that something that would, so I'm, I'm, I would have a kind of a careful attitude, cautious attitude towards, uh, uh, you know, recessions, uh, bear right. markets over that long period. Now, I call, I call this intermediate term. If yeah. it's just within one, two, up to three yeah. years, that's an intermediate term. Okay. If it's within a month or two or three, we call this a short term. If it's within a decade, two or three, so I, I, I have, we I call have, this I, a secular. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I have another two categories from, okay. from my, uh -huh. as I said before, I'm a trader myself. So from, from my point of view, so if you go down from very very long time period to a simply a long time period to a medium time period, I, I would call it from months to quarters. So that's okay. in my medium term in oh, terms of visibility. Term. Okay. Uh, where, uh, from my perspective, so th this is again the the realm of the area where you start talking about leading economic indicators, right. the yield curve, etc. Where I have. A very bullish attitude, and that's why you know I was I was keen to, to play the 
the bull uh, side the, and, the, and our counter. Be, 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 exactly, because that is the time period where I feel particularly strong about uh, positive prospects. Mm -hmm. Again, months to quarters. If we go down to the very short uh, time period of days to weeks, I'm actually a bear. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at what happened last week, uh, where well, the stock market came down by 6% and the Nasdaq, Nasdaq Composite, uh, and the, uh, then on Monday we had a strong uh, right. reaction so rally of 3% or so, and then yesterday we had a fall of a two, over 2% two in the Nasdaq again. So, so it, you know, it's, been, it's been quite volatile and exaggerated volatility. A number, I mean, he, um, considered from the historical perspective, uh, is not particularly, uh, you know, high volatility. It is particularly high if you look at it from the filter of the last year, or where the volatility has been very low, right? Artificially so, low and artificially correct. suppressed below so, 10. So, so in, in, in the realm of uh, days to weeks, uh, that's where you start talking about you know, technical indicators, moving averages, advanced decline lines, uh, sentiment indicators, this, this kind of things that gauge, give you a gauge about the, the, the health of the stock market. Mm -hmm. um, and I you know, happen to be today, mm -hmm. uh, what, what do we have on March 28, 2018, I happen to be quite negative today, but that can change next week or next few days. Okay, so with so in terms of short-term trading positions and strategies. Yeah, exactly. So entry points and these kind of things. But that is probably you know if this video is going to be online uh, yeah. for for forever. Uh, yeah, so for that, that, that that is kind of less relevant. What happens in the next few days or a week? So you're uh, you're bullish what intermediate? Term? Intermediate. Term. Three, okay, like intermediate. three six I, I, months nine months. Correct. How you define yeah. it? Yeah, and that that is based on on a number of things. Um, for over the next say six months to twelve months, or let's say maximum a year. Okay. So, which is what you can predict with, um, say, economic indicators and other yeah. indi indicators. You can make, that good you can make a case uh, based on historical yeah. precedent of how those indicators have uh, uh, behaved, right? So again, the what is considered the most, um, the strongest indicator for recessions is the so-called yield curve, as you know, the difference the between short-term interest rates and long-term interest rates. Well, doesn't it worry you that the yield curve keeps going down and yeah. down and down and down and still, and we're at the 10-year low on the two 10-year yield curve? It's, it's been coming down, but the, the actually the spread between the 10 and the two-year uh, uh, interest rates is not a, is not the indicator. The actual inversion is the indicator. Correct. Right? When it turns negative. When it turns negative, right? And and that hasn't happened. And we are actually at the current pace. We're long. We're at least a year away from that point, right? Oh, uh, okay. And then that give or, or say have obviously you don't know how the interest rate will move against each other, but uh, yeah. At if the current pace, the pace. It, it seems that it's it's going to take at least another six months or so to invert, and from there you you have another six months six to months. a year notice from the yield curve in the sense of when the recession is going to start, right? right. So, so, th so there is a kind of all clear signal from the yield curve. If you look at econo leading economic indicators, there are plenty of those, uh, but the, those that have had in the past a predict predictive uh, value for the health of the economy, most of them also signal clear sailing ahead in terms of the economy for the next 6 to 12 months. In terms of the macroeconomic growth. You Correct, mean. yeah. And, and then there is the stock market, which in itself is a leading indicator, right? Now, if you look at the stock market over the last month or so, it's been kind of going down. And you, you might argue, okay, that is a leading economic indicator. So it, that, or leading indicator, which might uh, tell you that the economy is going to turn. So now, now you have a, 
divergence in the opinion of the stock market, giving you negative signs, and the leading economic indicators on the yield curve giving you yeah. positive signs, yeah. right? Continuation of the positive trend. Correct. So basically, over the course of the next couple of months, mm -hmm. that divergence will have to clear one way or the other, correct? Mm -hmm. So either the stock market is right and the economy is going to tank, okay. or the leading economic indicators on the yield curve is right and the stock market is going to go up. So my opinion is that, so Paul Samuelson, uh, Nobel, Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, famously said that the, uh, the stock market has forecast nine of the last five recessions, and probably that, that was, I don't know, 10 years ago or more. Yeah. So basically the stock market has a 50% uh, false alarm rate. Correct. More or less, Correct. right? So in many cases, stock market behaves like a manic depressive uh, uh, thing right. that, uh, you know, becomes either too optimistic or too pessimistic in the face of things which turn out to be not so positive or negative, right? Mm -hmm. So, I guess that, so my, my, my opinion, my personal opinion, mm -hmm. and this is my personal call, is that over the course of the next months, there will be a resolution of this conflict that will be in favor of the leading economic indicators and the yield curve, and the stock market will go up. Right. In other words, a further economic growth and further Correct. continuation of the bull trend in the stock market. Correct. Okay. And so um, there are you know a few things that I I think uh, make my cement my thesis uh, in favor of further economic growth and ultimately a. Uh, an increase in the in the stock market going forward, aligning itself with the economy. With the economy. Mm -hmm. So, one is the impact of the tax the tax cut rate in 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 the U.S., which is mm -hmm. progressively trickling down into the the whole economy. Hopefully you, so. Hopefully you you so. might argue that uh, the 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 uh, decreased tax rates are partially priced in the stock market. That might well be the case, at least partially. But you know many of the things that that tax rate has uh, or will cause uh, are only now just starting, right? So you have the capital repatriation, where uh, companies such as Apple, famously, uh, you know, in aggregate, the the estimate is that they're going to repatriate something like a trillion dollars back to the U.S. Hopefully, so. Um, what are they going to do with all that money? A trillion dollars is a lot of money, right? And they're going to do stock buybacks favoring the stock market. Uh, they're going to do M&A, again, favoring uh, valuation of, of companies. And they possibly they even will do investments, uh, question mark, well, to, what, to what extent, yeah. you know, what, what is going to be the split of, of this different use of fund, uh, uh, potential use of fund, uh, uh, nobody knows. But, uh, you know, all three things, yes. the, the buybacks, M&A, Dividends. Dividends as well. Dividends, they'll boost which, the dividend yield. Exactly. So all these things are positive for the stock market. And the economy as well, because obviously that, that brings liquidity into a system which gets put to use. Then you have the infrastructure plan, which has been announced. Another trillion dollars, allegedly. Yes. Right? Uh, Mr. Trump likes big round numbers. Um, that is certainly much needed in the US, and apparently it also has bipartisan support. So probably that is a, one of the things which is, has a relatively high likelihood to occur in one way or the other. And that again will lead to uh, you know, investments and uh, mm -hmm. economic activity, which at least initially, until you start feeling the effects you know, the, the negative consequences of overinvesting, uh, there will be a kind of a, a window where things are going to look, look good. good. Yeah, right? yeah. And if we're, if we're looking into this next six to 12 months, probably that, that, that's the window we're talking about. What happens beyond that uh, is anyone, anybody's guess. Right? Right. Okay. You have, talking about infrastructure, you have outside of the US, the gigantic 
Belt and Road Initiative, which is, as you know, driven by China, uh, and they have pledged to invest around one trillion dollars, another trillion dollars, or more, yeah. uh, which yeah. is ten times the Marshall Plan. Yeah, is this this what they call Silk Road Two? Yeah, well, that, that's that, 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 so exactly that, that, that's part of it. That, that is, this is all the investment in infrastructure to kind of lubricate the commerce between the former Silk Road from China through the Middle East to Europe, yeah. right? Meaning the Far East to Western Europe. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So um, that is certainly going to be good for the world economy. Uh, it's going to be very, very good for commodities, right? Um, then there is another thing which is a, perhaps a little bit more controversial, which uh, is what I call the end of Pax Americana. Okay. So Pax Americana, as, as everybody knows, is, is the period of uh, relative peace that we had over the last, depending on how you define it, say 50 years or so, yeah. where um, you know, the world had a, had a peaceful period relative basis compared to other time periods uh, and that was driven by the preponderance of a great power uh, the United States of America as the global military might that would kind of police the whole world right Pax America that is clearly coming to an end uh, and what we're seeing now is the emergence of a multilateralism where uh, there is no one policeman in the whole world, but you have multiple poli policemen. Well, trilateralism. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so you certainly have uh, the US, you certainly have China, you have, certainly have Russia, and other mi minor mites, uh, minor powers, Europe, uh, the UK, uh, yeah. also playing a role. Yeah, Japan, minor. Japan, minor. exactly. So, what you, what you have, by the way, uh, you might or might not like that. I certainly don't like the idea of uh, uh, you know conflicts in war potential war. increasing in the future. I certainly ab abhor that idea. Yeah, but it's good for business. It's good for business, and right? It's good so, for profits. Yes. So, and so sometimes so, good for commodities. Usually results in commodity bull markets. Now, well, question is inflation, but go, go ahead. Yeah. So, so basically, that is going to certainly lead to a remilitarization of many parts of the world, uh, which will be good for commodities, as you said, it will be good for tech, for technology, um, so, so, you know, and good for business ultimately. So all these things are kind of soft factors that create a general picture of, you know, a general uh, picture where, where the, the positives overwhelm the negatives. Last but not least, I would like to say that, um, and that I know that that is a, a subject which is dear to your heart, uh, and we can discuss more about it, um, inflation. Inflation has held back, uh, has been held back uh, over, you know, the, 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 last, the, 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 the last couple of, of decades, um, in spite of this enormous monetary binge that we've had all over the world, as opposed to what many people expected and, and were convinced was going to happen, that we go, we're going to go back to the 70s and, and inflation is going to destroy, destroy the world economy, that didn't happen. And it, why it didn't happen? Clearly the explanation is you know, two things, technology and globalization, right? Um, so. Meaning China, China sending us cheap goods and China keeping its currency devalued against the dollar and therefore keeps its exports cheap to the rest of the world. So, yeah, so of course, all, all these things are very important, but if you look at, you know, you go specifically into the components of inflation, um, historically the, you know, the times when we've had runaway inflation, say in the US in the 70s, uh, typically that is linked with wage inflation, right? So wage inflation seems to be what actually triggers a sustained increase in inflation beyond, beyond so for, you, you might have, you know, 
uh, a problem with a supply of one commodity that leads to a little bit of increase in inflation, but then they come that, that, as somebody said, you know, uh, high prices are the cure for high prices, basically, because they attract investments. And uh, so with commodities, they go up and then they go down uh, because, you know, uh, high price attracts uh, increase in supply. So a sustained increase in inflation seems to be driven historically by a uh, an increase in wage inflation. Wage inflation, which provides positive feedback, feedback loops. into the uh, prices. Okay. Correct. So, and technology and globalization are have have been acting as you know great deterrents against wage inflation. Why? Because if you you know with technology you can increasingly substitute um, manpower through technology and through global globalization we've had over the last 10, 20 years, the, the, the trend that you know people can outsource and offshore development of tasks which were uh, previously done onshore, thus creating a, uh, a deterrent of, of wage inflation because you know if you don't want to do this job for one dollar, no problem. There are uh, you know Filipinos who will and Indians who will. Correct. Oh, okay. So. Correct. So so both technology and globalization have been uh, you know great factors in my view to keep inflation low price inflation pr price inflation low in spite of the gigantic monetary inflation that we've had right which historically in, in previous uh, decades used to be you know go go high and high so um but where is the discrepancy going between this extraordinary monetary inflation and the very low price inflation it can go in couple of places. For example, it can go uh, into giant bubbles in Asia like India and uh, China or it can go into giant stock market and probably bond yeah. market yeah. bubbles which events eventually might, you know, somewhere, somehow this inflation or inflation, monetary inflation eventually seeps in. It, it, and it, and, and, and I, I'm not going to argue with where is it. So my, 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 my bull case, uh, you, you might have noticed that uh -huh. I, I, I haven't mentioned my bull case at all. Valuations. Why? Valuation. Because for the time frame that I'm talking about, okay. uh, six to twelve months, valuations don't matter. Right. They simply don't matter. And it might very well be. In fact, there there is a lot of evidence that a lot of the quantitative easing money, the QE money, uh, and a lot of the monetary inflation that we've had uh, in the U.S., in Europe, in Japan, in China, has gone ended up not in in the real economy, but in the financial economy. Uh, right. Hence, you know, blowing up uh, bubbles, if you will, or you know, in leading assets. to an increase financial in financial assets, financial assets, and increasing prices in financial assets. Now, the question is: Is this going to all end abruptly? And is you know, it, all, the supply of money is going to dry up, and hence lead to a crash in the stock market? Might eventually be, but not in the time, frame, in my view, not in the time frame okay. that uh, of the next six to twelve months. Why? Because there is no reason from the from the good and service inflation, wage inflation point of view, mm -hmm. that that is going to happen. In my okay. view, all the trends that have led to a low inflation rates in goods and services and, and wages. They're all still there. Technology is still there. Actually, technology is still accelerating, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so you have, you know, uh, the whole thing started with uh, 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 the strong influence of technology in 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 wage inflation. Say, say, let's say it started before that. But let's say, uh, you know, very important was the, the advent of PCs and then software and then the internet and mobile te mobile technologies. Today we have cloud technologies, we have uh, the Internet of Things coming up, we have drones, we have uh, autonomous driving cars, yeah. uh, all sorts of technology, the blockchain technology, which I think is going to revolutionize finance, all sorts of things which, you know, are actually still accelerating. Everything, the pace of change is going to continue to increase in the future, and hence the deflationary 
influence of, of technology is going to continue, it's going, arguably it's going to continue uh, accelerating that, that, uh, that influence. On the other hand, you have globalization, which you could argue at, at the moment is suffering from a little bit of a drawback with protectionist policies emanating out of the US and uh, you have populistic mo uh, movements uh, in different parts of the world, of the, of the Western world in particular. Italy, Spain. Yeah. So, so that, that might dampen a little bit the influence, the positive influence of globalization on, 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 on reducing inflation. But I think that you have, you know, an accelerating influence of, the technolo of technology with perhaps a diminishing little bit diminishing uh, influence of globalization. And you say, oh, I say only a little bit because the press talks a lot about you know, the tariffs in the US and, 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 and all these kind of things, the populistic movements in, in certain parts of Europe. But what you don't read much is you know, the significant increase of uh, regional commerce in Asia, for instance, right? where you have the, the so-called South-South trade mm -hmm. uh, or the advent of the new uh, silk routes uh, with with a significant increase of commerce in the region of yeah. Asia, intra which, Asian, trade. intra Asian, which which is I think you know very very positive uh, for for the economy and also has a dampening effect on inflation. So, but globalization you can argue is is something that has some positives and negatives, mm -hmm. uh, and technology is clearly very very positive. Uh, in that regard. So all in all put together, I think that the, uh, the uh, uh, good, good, goods and service inflation, wage inflation will remain subdued and hence the motivation of central bankers to uh, slam on the brakes of their monetary policy over the course of the next 6 to 12 months is not going to be so strong. Uh, so I think that we are safe from that perspective, right? In the long run, whether we at some point we're going to have to lead with the consequences of all the money creation we've had over the last decade um, or not, is still a question mark. You know, if you are, if you look at Japan, you know, they've been doing it for so long and they haven't had to pay the bills yet. Um, whether the world is moving towards a Japanese model or whether the world is going to end up like Zimbabwe, we don't know, right? Yeah. Uh, and there are arguments for and against it. In any case, that is beyond my trading horizon. Right, so right, so right. Um, I'm, 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 I'm going to deal with that when right. we get there, right? Or. And there's going to be, if we, if we end up like Zimbabwe, there's going to be plenty of opportunities to trade that, right? To so, trade that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, now, uh, first of all, in terms of a long term, because you said you're very bullish long term, Japan, since 27 years, now the market may be tradable, but it's mostly down and mostly down and mostly down, and it was 40,000 and it's now 20 or so, so it's 50% down in 27 years. So stock markets don't always come back even within 20 years, example is US and British markets, uh, US market, British market, Japanese market. So how, what, what, what's wrong with, how is Japan different in that for 27 years, the market, stock market isn't coming back? Yet? Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at a, a, a very, very narrow uh, segments of the market, um, you could, clearly conclude that so if, if you go down to certain equities, right, if you say uh, company XYZ actually went bust, so it never came back, never right? Came back. So, so that, that, is, that is very clear uh, on the one extreme. On the other extreme, if you look at the world markets as equity, as an asset class, and, okay. and you, have, you look at it with certain flexibility that you say, I don't have to put all my money in Japan at the height of the, of the valuation uh, oh. bubble, then you have to conclude that over the long run, equity markets go up, right? Uh, because that's what in general, do. yes, yeah, yeah. globally, globally. Global, so, yeah. so maybe the choice might be China, or might have been China, or it may have been whatever. Okay, all right. So that's good enough. Now, to what extent do you agree that over the last 
10 or so years since the bottom of the global financial crisis in whatever 2009 or 10 or so that the markets had been driven mostly if not almost entirely by liquidity central bank liquidity that liquidity has been the main driver and that drying up of liquidity would similarly suck the air out of the stock market bubble? Well, I mean, to start with the second question, no doubt about it. It's absolutely clear that the moment you start sucking liquidity out of the market, that will have negative consequences on, on stock prices. That, that is very clear. Um, and the, in fact, Historically, there's, 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 there's been a strong correlation between uh, liquidity, however you define it, define. By, be it by credit, you know, bank credit, uh, yeah. or you know, interest rates, or quantitative easing, uh, liquidity, and, and, yeah. and stock markets going up and down. That is very clear, so it's absolutely 100% uh, written in stone, if you will, that if you have a significant reduction in, in liquidity. liquidity, global liquidity, that is going to have negative consequences on stock markets. No, no question about that. Well, now, if I may ask now, in this particular case, what currently would you consider to be good symptoms or indicators of relatively abundant liquidity? Because I have a few which tell me that we have a rapidly shrinking liquidity. So what are your good metrics for liquidity? Currently, um, so along the fact that you know the stock markets all over the world, if you disregard the last uh, months. months or or, month you know, or or month and a half, uh, have uniformly been uh, you know in at, at, at record territory in record territories in record values. Um, the uh, what, 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 what is the book you're currently... Yeah, yeah. So, so, so basically the point that, I, that you just made, I don't know if that uh, got yes. recorded or not, is that uh, the, the valuation level uh, increases the risk uh, of uh, either losses of, or lower returns going forward. Right. And I, I wanted but, to show this, this, this book, uh, okay. it's called Unexpected Returns from Ed Easterling. Ed uh, Easterling. Basically well, let's, let's has... Up close, right? Close up. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's a it's meanwhile must be like I don't know, over ten years old. Uh, this book, but it's still very uh, relevant mm -hmm. in the sense that what he did was to analyze the returns, historical returns, mm -hmm. based on your starting point, right? So if if you Correct. as you said at, at the beginning of our conversation, if you start uh, the day before the crash in nineteen twenty nine. Obviously, your your return will be uh, will be lower. Uh, Much lower. At some point, you will recover, uh, but it's going to take a long time to recover. And your expected returns statistically will be lower. And he made a very good point of correlating long-term returns, so ten-year returns, correct, based on the valuation level the at your entry, right? Correct. And and that, there is clearly a um, an indirect uh, proportional relationship between your entry valuation and your Correct. expected return. Right. The lower you are the entry valuation, the higher your expected return and vice versa. Correct. And arguably we are now in in a you know in the higher high to uh, overvalued territory. Yeah so, so certainly in the in the top quartile, probably the top decile even in terms of historical valuations uh, as an entry point. So if, if you say, I am a buy and hold investor, that I'm going to buy equities shares today, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to look back in the next uh, you know, seven to 10 years. 10 years, okay. Um, probably this is not the best time to invest, right? Yes, probably certainly it, it, not. It, 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 it is, it, is, it might, it, you, it, even, be, even though this is very dangerous to say, but, uh, because the opportunity cost in the stock market for not being invested has historically been very high. So if, if, you, if you say, I'm going to wait for a better time to invest, 
you might very well miss, uh, you know, it might very well be that the next two years are amazing, that the stock market doubles in the next two years. It might happen. Right? And you might miss it. Yeah. And you might miss it. Or so, you may have to wait for 10 years for the stock market to renormalize, to get back to normal valuations. Correct. Like 1966, the market was considered quite overvalued and had to wait for at least 10 or 15 years Correct. before you can get in a meaningful valuation. I mean, you could have gotten it 74, 75 after the first Correct. leg down. Okay. So, so, you know, in hindsight, the best time to invest was during the Great Recession, right? In 2009, if you were invested yeah, in, I don't know, February, March, whatever the lows was, uh, where the S&P went down to 666 uh, intraday, Right, the devil's number. Number uh, of the beast. Yeah. Um, so, so that that would have been amazing if you would have invested that. Then you could have forgotten about it for ten years. Look back right. ten years after, and fantastic, right? And tripled your money. Tripled your money. Um, the starting point today is clearly not as not as good, uh, and probably looking out from today over the course of the next ten years, there's going to be a significant period of drawdown where uh, in losses just in losses. plain old losses yeah. okay. in other words uh, today is not a good time to be a long-term investor what yeah. you're suggesting is long term well at least my good guess is is definitely stocks are a bad investment very short term they might be risky for all sorts of unpredictable but what you're saying is intermediate term they may still be a good investment now, what about the following indicators? Uh, LIBOR has been steadily and dangerously and relatively rapidly rising, especially the premium of LIBOR over the risk-free rate. Isn't that a very strong indicator of rapidly, uh, rapid reduction in liquidity. Isn't LIBOR worrying you? The rapid increase in LIBOR I, 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 worrying I, yeah, you too I'm, much? I'm, I'm not aware of LIBOR being a particularly strong indicator. Uh, are you talking the, the, the absolute level or, or, or the spread? Uh, Both but because, because, because the same what time. you have to keep in mind when we talk about interest rates which are going up. Historically, the first couple of years of rising interest rates the first two percent usually. The, the, yeah, typically they've been very good for the stock market, and uh, so that that that, in particular, considering the absolute levels of the of the interest rates, which are, you know, so damn low, so absolutely low, that uh, I have difficulties imagining that for you know the effect of, on the economy is going to be. Uh, very strong when companies typically generate you know returns uh, in the in the close great companies generate much higher returns but on average uh, overall mm -hmm. let's say you know 10 percent returns or so is a, the capitalistic system when it's working well uh, kind of gives you that kind of uh, return uh, yeah. return on investment and and so, so your business can generate 10% and you have to pay, you know, if you're a corporate, a reasonably uh, well, uh, you know, solid corporate, you have to pay much less than that. Much, 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 much less, less than, than that, that right? Correct. So, so, the, so the, for, yeah, I think we have a couple of percentage points uh, from Lean where we are point. now to the point where it start, starts to actually hurt. Hurt. Okay. In other words, the fir the way I read it is the first two percent of increases are relatively benign mm -hmm. for the stock market, and somewhere along on the third percent, the the stock market begins to feel the pain. Well, that's what they're saying is that we at the LIBOR of two thirty or so, two twenty seven, two thirty, is already begin to feel the pain. Well, what about another indicator, credit? spreads of first credit spreads for investment grades which have been widening significantly up against rising risk-free rates and second junk spreads which have been widening against investment grade 
and against, against uh, and same, against same, same, same argument. Is exactly the same, same, same argument. argument. I, I, I would view that as yeah, up, up, up until I think a month or two ago, there was uh, one company in Europe which was I forgot the name, but was was considered a junk uh, bond, which Hello. issued for less than the equivalent treasury in the US, right? Correct. So, 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 even if, if, the, if the margins are widening in corporate debt, uh, well, I think that we are at such low, historical, such low right. levels. In times when the economy, the global economy seems to be in a pretty synchronized uh, growth phase, so that the opportunities for businesses are very attractive out there, and money is still cheap in comparison to the return rates that company can, companies can achieve. So again, it is becoming progressively less and less attractive to borrow, but we still have, you know, a, a notice period until this is going to actually negatively affect the economy and hurt companies of another, you know, uh, six months to a year, f absolutely sure, right? And there's another thing that I want to say re regarding stock markets, which uh, I think is a, you know, a phrase that I like a lot, but um, and, and it has proven to be very true over, over, over time, which is uh, the famous uh, phrase by John Templeton, which is, bull markets are born on pessimis pessimism, right. uh, grow on, on skepticism, mature on optimism, Mm -hmm. and die of euphoria, right? Yes. And I personally think, my personal point of view is that we are now in the mature phase of the bull market, oh. where, where we are in an optimistic period, but the euphoria, we haven't seen yet. We haven't seen the euphoria comparable to, you know, as we started chatting, we said, we both uh, remember the, the 2000 bubble very well, the tech bubble, the dot-com bubble very well. I mean, we're nowhere near those times. We're nowhere near the the euphoria we had in the in the in the stock in, in the in the housing market pre Great Recession in the U.S. Right. What about 2017? Every month up, 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 up. Wasn't that euphoria or just the bull market? Yeah, I mean. Uh, what about the ultra? The public participation is still relatively low if you look at individual investors sentiment indicators um, you've had you know the month of January was a month where where you know uh, the, the public seemed to start getting interested January 2018 but before that even throughout the 2000 the year 2017 which uh, as you said we had I think 14 consecutive consecutive months uh, 2016, the end of 2016, and the whole 2017 and January 2018, uh, 14 or 15 months of stock markets going up every month, right? Mm -hmm. And it became, I think, the longest streak uh, ever. Yet that was, for the most part, some people have called it the, the, the most hated bull market in history, right? Because we've been, you know, we had a long run still the public participation is is very low was very low yeah. was very low and, and many people obviously got hurt badly by uh, by the collapse in the in the housing market in the us and the subsequent collapse of the stock market as well so that um that has led to a, in general a very low participation rate of the public which usually is the one that fuels the the last phase the euphoria phase it is the last so the my last. expectation is actually there will be the euphoria is coming it's still ahead of us still coming it's okay. still ahead of us and i you know i hope i will be, i will be benefiting from that and i hope i will be mm -hmm. smart enough to uh, you know to exit at the right to, time to know when to exit but, before the herd. Exactly. But because if you remember in 2000, the Nasdaq went up by 50% in, 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 in four months, right? Uh, right. In that euphoric phase, right? Correct. So if you say, you know we what? We call it the blow off. The blow off, the blow -off phase. phase, yes. 
So, so you're still expecting a blowout to phase for the yeah. stock market. Yeah. Well, did we say, did we see the blowout phase in uh, crypto like Bitcoin? That's where we saw the blowout phase, and that would presage also the higher volatility in the stock market. Or, if, I mean, be, crypto, because that's where the public was. The public was in yeah, Bitcoin for the most part. Especially, no? especially the uh, the young generation. Uh, yeah, the millennials. The millennials. Uh, the you know our generation, I guess, that had a, a much 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 smaller participation. You you had the old people, yeah. you know old people in their forties uh, and fifties participating, but but in, very in the Mark Faber, Peter Schiff generation had no, no participation whatsoever. at all. They wouldn't um, even touch it. Yeah, that's right, and and. You know the 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 whole crypto space is so minute oh, in yeah. comparison yeah. to the stock market, where you yeah, had it's tiny. the market capitalization of all cryptocurrencies, two thousand or so cryptocurrencies put together. Today, it's, it's just something like three hundred billion yeah, dollars. Half a at, trillion. At, at the peak, it was six hundred yeah, or so. Half a trillion, trillion roughly. Yes. Which is a little bit more than half the market cap of Apple. Yes, one apple, correct. Right? Yeah. So um, it's one twentieth of the US market, probably one hundredth of the global stock market. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's, it's, it's just it's, one or two percent of the whole it's stock market. It's my news. And um, you know, you, you, I, I don't have a very strong opinion regarding uh, where cryptocurrencies are going to go. No, I'm not asking about that. They, I, I'm just uh, saying that it's an indicator of where the euphoria actually was. Okay, that's uh, the increased volatility of the stock market, which is becoming more and more sustained since February 5 uh, volatility event. Now we are back more or less sitting in the 20s. Does that worry you or not so much? As a trader, I actually like volatility, right? Okay. Uh, that gives me opportunities to um, uh, to invest into companies which are, uh, you know, uh, get run over by by uh, an an emotional burst of volatility mm -hmm. in in the stock markets and and buy them at. Uh, Buy the stock of a company that is uh, fundamentally sound at a very attractive valuation levels, and I'm still finding a lot of companies that uh, are trading for you know solid companies with growth potentials that range from you know 20 to 100 percent uh, growth rates, and uh, and you still find them at PE multiples of you know 10, 12 times uh, forward uh, uh, forward PE. So, and when volatility exacerbates the movements of stock prices, that gives you the, the opportunity to actually invest at very attractive valuations okay, okay, at definitely. on individual company basis. Mm -hmm. So, so volatility. So, so I, I, I very much welcome volatility. I love volatility. Okay. Now, what about all of these analysts, which very convincingly provide uh, uh, similarities? To 1987 before the October stock market crash. What I did as an exercise, because that's what I've learned from uh, experiences, let me go and watch back a documentary, what really happened right before the 1987 crash. And what I discovered, of course, not to my surprise, to my expectation, you know, that as they explain the environment before the 87 crash, it applies perfectly to the economic environment today. Rising volatility, weakening dollar, rising long-term interest rates, rising short-term interest rates, opening credit spreads, uh, liquidity drying, LIBOR is increasing. In other words, you have a whole litany of indicators of almost perfect similarity right before the 87 crash to the current situation today. What, what, yeah, I mean, in, 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 indeed, indeed uh, I've also read a little bit about that and, and I found uh, many similarities uh, to be quite uh, uncanny. Um, 
what has to be said is that, you know, even if you bought on the Friday before Black Monday, right, it took you less than a year to recover, right? So, so that, that, that is, um, if you are in a bull market, as we think, it's very clear that we are, yeah. right? Um, and if you have a non-recessionary yeah. crash, such as the 87 crash, you, even if it catches you, you know, at the worst, worst, worst possible timing, you have a good chance, based on historical evidence yeah. uh, uh, of 87, or, to recover rather quickly. Or you have the green span put, or the Bernanke which, put, which, 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 or the which yellow if, put. If, if at all, uh, has, uh, you know, has become even more prevalent. And, but then it wasn't really clear whether there was a, a Greenspan put or not. Today it is very clear that, uh, that you know, it is... That there was. That, that there was, and that there still is. is that, you know, it's, it's so clear, given the debt levels we have in, uh, you know, in the economy, that, and, and also the governments, right? The government has a vested interest... In keeping it in place. In, in keeping the interest rates low, because the main, you know, the, the, even though the, the debt in the US has gone up by over double uh, to over 20 trillion dollars today, 21, 21 correct, trillion today. Uh, the cost of servicing that debt has actually gone down, correct, right? Uh, so that basically, if you apply interest rates which were completely normal 10 to 20 years ago, to the current levels of debt, you realize that's completely unsustainable. They can't pay that, exactly. right? Because they, you would end up taking all the, the 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 tax revenues and giving them to creditors, right? There there is no money yeah. to pay for the state uh, uh, when you when you have to pay such a so so the government. Long story short, has a very strong vested interest in keeping interest rates depressed, artificially low, artificially financial, low. financial right. repression. So. You are, you know, uh, in all our conversations, you, you know, you always point out to me that you have to f look at what the interests of the actors are so that yeah. you understand what the outcome is going to be, right? right. So that, that takes you clearly to the outcome, which is the government is going to try to, and that, you know, the well, old Greenspan puts uh, is, you know, is still there, right? Because mm -hmm. clearly, when the wealth effect goes in reverse, that can induce so a crash in the in the stock markets can induce a recession, uh, and 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 central bankers don't want to be in the history books as Blame. the guys yes. playing the role of you know the bad guy that actually caused a recession, or or a depression such as the bank, uh, central bankers of of uh, of twenty uh, of nineteen twenty nine. Ben so Strong, yeah. yeah, well, he died. Yeah. So, so, the, so it, it, again, you might not like that, right? And I'm not saying I like it. Right. I, I, I actually would like to have a world that doesn't have this, uh, you know, booms and busts and all these bubbles. Exaggerated but, booms yeah, and busts. Correct. Yeah. So, but, but, you know, the central banks of the world and uh, the economy and the stock markets have a tendency of ignoring where I like. Right. So, <laughs> and following what central bankers and politicians exactly, exactly. So, so what do wish. you do? What do you do as as a as as a you know a, a logical thinking person? You you say, well, this is actually control. beyond my control. What? How, how do I position myself to actually benefit from the trends that I might or might not like, but are you know be completely beyond my control? Mm -hmm. Well, don't you feel? I mean. Three, four, five, six years ago, I began to feel that financial markets have become a complete and total joke. I mean, I'm teaching financial <laughs> markets and basically the function to channel capital to the, its most productive uses, right? But it turns out that none of these fundamental functions of capital markets. Uh, the, the, the stock market is a big, giant joke. It's just a casino. The bond market being repressed 
to the point where it doesn't measure any more scarcity of capital, it doesn't measure any more risk. In other words, financial markets don't mean much anymore. Uh, again, talking about your best example is Italian company, Italia Telecom, mm -hmm. uh, being a junk bond company earning less, meaning paying interest less than the US government, has to be one of the biggest parodies of modern investment. I mean, it's like, how do you invest in an environment when an Italian junk company pays lower interest than the supposedly infinitely better credit of the US and, government? And, 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 the, and, and the answer there, I guess, uh, like in, ma in many situations, is basically follow the money, right? Who is, who is the guy with the biggest checkbook? And in Europe, it's clearly Mr. Draghi. Mr. Uh, who, who is who is basically underwriting these crazy situations, and um, so what do you do, right? Do you do you uh, as a small guy do you do you uh, do you play with them or, or do you play against them? And, and there there is there is the answer is very clear. Or, or you don't play, right? Right. Or you My don't answer play. is don't play. Yeah. Stay out of the stock market because you're playing with fire. Yeah. Stay well, out of so the bond market because. You might not, you know, know, or, you know, which currency is going to hit when and how. Yeah. So, 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 regarding the your kind of uh, grim view of the stock market, I have to say that even though I agree that the uh, you know sometimes it's difficult to find the logic, that, you know, the, the, the driving logic behind certain movements in the stock market. What has to be said is that the stock market is a great in capitalism. Right, fulfills the great role of capital allocation, which uh, you know communism and socialism tried to do centrally and does a much worse job. Yeah, and failed completely. And, and failed completely. So, right. so this is what we have. This is the only option that has shown that it works more or less, right? With excesses with and with uh, with uh, sometimes manic depressive manic depressive uh, reactions, but right. it when works more or less when it's allowed. To work because these days it's not even allowed to well work I mean you, you, you could argue that for instance if you look at going back to valuations you, you have uh, uh, companies that have you know very high valuation in the stock market uh, some companies are making losses hence you know have a P of uh, infinitum uh, and Tesla uh, Tesla for instance but you know that has in a way and I don't want to defend Tesla actually uh, up until uh, uh, Recently, I was short Tesla, and I actually made made money on that. Um, so, uh, but I actually love the entrepreneurial spirit of Mr. of Mr. Elon Musk, who has created not only one but three different companies: Solar City, Tesla, and SpaceX. Uh, and all of all three of them are doing great things for the world, right? Supposedly, supposedly, uh, 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 that's my opinion. So. Um, the a mechanism that allows capital to flow into companies that promise a great future and some of them will fail along the way and investors will lose money it's much better than investors lose money by the way that this the government loses money in communism and socialism right yeah much yeah, much yeah, better yeah much better uh, so in new you know what you're dealing with at least you know you're dealing with Facebook, even though they don't have any profit. At least you know it's Facebook. Well, Facebook actually has a lot of profits, right? A lot of profits. But uh, Tesla uh, is, is losing a ton of money. And uh, yeah, so, so, so basically, the, what, what has to be said about, especially the American stock market, as opposed to all the other stock markets in the world, is that if you look at the, great, at the largest companies in the US, Eight out of ten are tech companies, and many of those didn't or tech exist. Related, yeah, or tech related. Yeah, or tech-related. Amazon or, is a tech-related yeah, yeah. tech-related company. So basically, you're doing retail in a, in a revolutionary way, and out of these uh, ten companies, many of them didn't even exist ten years ago, right? Facebook or existed, uh, I, I guess, fifteen years ago yeah. or something like that. Uh, was, was started. I don't remember the number, uh, the, the exact date, but uh, yeah, you know, 10 to 15 half years. Of, half of yeah. LinkedIn and whatnot. 
So that is, that is absolutely amazing in the US. And, and that, I think, in a way justifies the valuation premium that you, you have historically had in the US as compared to, say, European markets, Asian markets, uh, emerging markets, where you have a bunch of great companies. I mean, in, in Europe, you have a bunch of great companies there as well. But very few of those are companies that you know became the top ten companies within within ten years or fifteen yeah. years of existence, right? Yeah. Uh, and you know you have great companies such I don't know uh, Daimler, Mercedes Benz, yeah. uh, you know it's, it's, it's BMW, a, yeah. BMW, so Sony. great companies, great companies, Sony. yeah, but um, that have growth rates which are interesting. You know the, a BMW, a, a Daimler is growing. I don't know the numbers, but I would say off the top of my head, perhaps ten percent. Perhaps Six, or, yeah. or something like that, Six, eight, yeah. uh, or low teens, but you have very few companies at that scale uh, of the you know the, the biggest companies in the world that are growing at growth rates of 20, 30, 40, 50 percent that you have in the US. Yeah, right? uh, Uber. Right. So 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 that that I think is something that we have to uh, keep on emphasizing that makes it the US stock market. Very special, unique. Yeah. Well, is this present anywhere else? How close would be the British market relative to the stock to the U.S. in that particular aspect? Not I, close. I, 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 uh, I I don't follow the British market very closely, but I would say the valuation of the British market is 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 clearly way below the U.S. Mm -hmm. and uh, and Britain has had a few examples of very creative uh, new new economy. Uh, tech companies that have uh, become very successful, uh, but not at the scale of the US, certainly. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't the US stock market, uh, for example, uh, especially the NASDAQ, the, driven just by a handful, half a dozen to a dozen, just the FANGS company or the FANG man company, it, where just two or three of them cracking could crack the whole NASDAQ and spill over to the whole stock market, isn't it too dependent on so few, like Amazon, I mean Amazon, yeah. what, my understanding hasn't made a profit yet, yeah. really, not really, it's still sucking more capital, still not generating profits, and just a, a, a crack in an Amazon and a Facebook, as we're possibly, possibly seeing, could literally collapse confidence in the whole US market. Isn't there such a tremendous vulnerability of the stock market? Um, so, the, I actually read the acronym uh, uh, FANG mania lately, uh, <laughs> yeah. which is if you add uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, Apple, uh, Netflix, or uh, or, or, or yeah. um, yeah, Microsoft, Apple, Netflix, yeah. Well, I don't know the IA. What's the IA? Intel? Intel and uh, okay. another A. I don't remember. Yeah, anyway, yeah, so, yeah. so there's, there's, there's the acronym uh, Fang Mania as well. And uh, clearly in a... That's if, the Nifty 50 today, right? The Nifty 50, yeah. Today. If, if, if you look at the... Uh, especially the, 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 the Nasdaq 100 index is obviously very heavily weighted is a market cap weighted index uh, the nasdaq composite less so but still uh, you know again market cap weighted so hence uh, the influence of the large companies is very large and it creates like a self-fulfilling prophecy because yeah. with all this self-feeding mechanism self of the way up, but right. could be yeah when it unfolds it becomes very nice correct yes. correct where two companies can trigger massive volatility to the point to shake down the whole market. Yeah, yeah. So, so that that is certainly the case. If you look at the valuation of companies like Apple, uh, that you know, arguably is a is a great company uh, that has uh, made the world a better place, if you will, and uh, and and it also you know created amazing products that people love and uh, uh, has also created. A, an, an environment, an ecosystem that makes customers very difficult to move away from. Yeah. Uh, so that, yeah. I'm a good example. I just bought the ultra skinny 12 inch MacBook. 
They, and I love it. I mean, I had a you seven, it. six, seven years you, old you, MacBook Pro, and I bought again the ultra thin, and I love it even a lot and, more. And and, and, and you're and you're and you're, and you're very value conscious, right? Very. And, and yeah, I wouldn't you waste still, you still pay, you, you still you still paid probably double what you could have paid for a PC, right? For uh, a comparable, in a way, uh, at least in in terms of the technical specs, uh, you know. Uh, uh, the speed of a processor and these things would have been, you could have probably gotten something even better yeah. uh, technically, yeah. but it's not an Apple price, product. Yeah. You know, it doesn't yeah. have the, the yeah. user friendliness of Apple, it doesn't have yeah. all the uh, kind of the environment of once you get used to using Apple, right? Uh, it's very yeah. difficult to, to move away. To move from. back. And, 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 and I know because I don't need to, I've never moved back. I've always used Apple at home and I've always had to use Microsoft and at, at work. And all the time, yeah. and, it and you hate it. You hate it. And, and, and I always hate the, the, the Microsoft and all the Apple uh, uh, at work to use it. So I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yes. So a company like Apple uh, is trading today. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't remember the exact number, but it must be something like you know, 16, 17 times, uh, depending whether you take past. Uh, uh, earnings or, or forward earnings or, you know it is at a reasonable multiple it's not you know well back in the old days reasonable was considered seven or eight but that's okay back in the old days yeah you, know, you have to go really? back uh, to very 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 old days to uh, with, with, with except with short exceptions uh, yeah but, back in know. the old days yeah five uh, or six was uh, outstanding and seven or eight nine was normal yeah, yeah. That, that was that back then but in the time when the Stock markets played a much, much smaller role in in the in the in the economy. The the percentage of people invested in the stock markets was much less. Yeah. I say uh, the, the, when the, when it was on the bubble. The the, the, the demographic uh, uh, of of the Western world was a completely different one as well. So you know there there, there are arguments. I, I I wouldn't want to get into that discussion in detail, yeah. but but there are arguments that say you know there are secular reasons why the stock market. Uh, deserves today a higher valuation than before, and especially those nifty fifty type of companies where you know an, an Apple, for instance, that has developed a situation that is such a strong economic moat, right? As, as yeah. uh, Warren Buffett calls it, uh, you know the business is very strongly protected. Even Warren Buffett has invested in, in Apple, yeah. right? Uh, the quintessential value investor uh, investing in Apple. Um, so that. Yeah, yeah. For, and, and, and so that creates a situation where the margins of a company like Apple are protected from competition. In a way, it creates a almost like a monopolistic situation that right. guarantees margin over the long term, right? Uh, and and that in turn um, justifies a high valuation, right? Right. Except that the company is phenomenally. Uh, vulnerable in the following sense. So much of its sales and profits are in China that all that the Chinese government needs, needs to do is ban Apple products in China and that would crush completely the stock with it, the whole NASDAQ yeah. and the whole US. I mean, there is that vulnerability. There, 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 China had the evil intent to crush the US financial industry. All they had to do is ban Apple products. But but in China. but, but, but that will be the, you know that would obliterate your bull thesis. I would assume. Yeah, for sure, and 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 there are many other such things that would absolutely kill S the stock singular market. Singular events. Singular events. So so. We, you know, the, the Earth could be uh, hidden by a meteorite. Well, well, no, no. Uh, you know, we're which, talking which about is, yeah, so, so, something uh, more. Apparently, a, a gigantic volcanic type of explosion from uh, the Yellowstone National Park in the U.S. Yeah, is overdue could, yeah, by yeah. hundred thousand years. Yeah. So that could happen as well. That could well, uh, lead us into a, you know an, an ice age, which would destroy the economy. Or you know some some dictator could uh, could you know drop a bomb over uh, Dubai or over you know whatever any other place. Yeah, yeah. Any uh, other so place, so yeah. so there is you know there are lots of unknowns unknowns or or known okay, unknowns right, right. which could trigger a very negative reaction. Right. Of, yeah. Anything of war, North yeah. Korea, nuclear war, well said. But but here this case could be just a hey uh, Trump is 
threatening China in a you know in, with trade in a very bad way, and China can simply. But respond. again, follow follow yeah. the money, as you yeah, always say. That's right? true. So, that's what are the vested interests for a country like China? Uh, to you know, a country that has benefited so tremendously from global commerce, uh, to actually say, you know what? Okay, we, we we're going to have a little reaction just to show that we are we are not uh, we we're not. Uh, um, uh, we don't fear uh, Mr. Trump, but otherwise, uh, you know, we, we, we actually, the, the game has been so much in our benefit and will continue to be in our benefit that we want to keep on playing the game, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so that, I, th I think that that is, that is uh, uh, at least, obviously there is uh, always multiple risks, but, you know, what is the probability that the risks are actually going to materialize? If, you, if you're going to live your life like an insurance policy, uh, Probably you're not going to be very happy, right? Uh, so, so, well, so, so, how about somewhere in between? How about you stay, let's say, with uh, uh, fifty or sixty percent of your assets outside the financial system, mostly in real estate and, uh, let's say, gold, and you can still play with twenty or thirty percent. How about this more balanced approach? What, in your view, is a good balanced investment approach when you're not risking? Too much on the stock market. Well, I guess that, that depends ultimately on who you are, right? So, so the best thing that you can do um, to maximize your financial success is with to do reasonable risk. Because with, you don't want to risk it all. Yeah, with the best thing that you can do is to do what you're best at, uh -huh. right? So, if you are a you know, exceedingly good at doing what you do, and you can invest more money in that very thing, you should diversify. You should put all your money in that very thing, and then probably you succeed. You're gonna succeed, right? If this is you know what you're absolutely yeah, best really in yeah. best in the world uh, at doing. So let's say you know talking about investments, if you are one of the great investors of this world uh, that, you know if you're Warren Buffett or if you, yeah. if you are in the value space or if you are you know there, there are a few yeah, uh, great, uh, value. Yeah, we, the, what about great the investors more yeah the more common people. so so th these people again I, I would argue why should you diversify if you if you have a yeah. great track record yeah uh, you know why diversify right the thing is that most you know, 99.9% .9 of the population of the world, uh, they would be, uh, you know, they're, they're not in that, in that camp that they're, you know, world-class investors. So uh, the need for diversification comes from the fact that you... From are lack of specialization. Lack of specialization. Yeah. So, 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 so what you're saying is what is well known is put all your eggs in one basket and then watch it carefully. If, That's if, your recommendation. if you are... You know, I can put all my eggs in the say the, the, the art uh, the art investing market, and I don't know much about art. Yeah. So even if I look at it, I look at it closely. Okay. Probably I'm going to be making a mistake, right. and I need to. I would need to be you know to learn the trade, the tricks of the trade for ten years before I become really good at it. Right. And then so 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 it depends on who you are, right? right. Uh, so if your expertise is cars, you buy classic. Cars and protect. If your expertise is books, you buy old, good, high quality books. Okay. So in that sense, if, if, so if, if, if you can the demo, demonstrate yeah. that that uh, what you're doing is something, you know, because you, 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 you can be very good at doing something that doesn't make money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or doesn't historically have, uh, doesn't have a track record in making money. And then probably you shouldn't be putting your money into something that doesn't ha have a track record in, in making money, right? So, so. Mm -hmm. So that is, you know, if, if you like, you know, collecting, uh, I don't know, collecting uh, stones, uh, uh, you know, uh, beach stones, mm -hmm. uh, something that does, doesn't pebbles. really have a, a, a scarcity value, doesn't have a pebbles, yeah, that, that doesn't have a, a, a strong, I wouldn't put all my fortune into that, right? That, right. that yeah. is clear. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, okay, yeah, yeah, well, it's clear. All right, let, let, let's try to, uh, uh, if you have any final thoughts, I have one final somewhat bigger question is the following for all of our viewers what was your best 
education in finance. How did you best learn in the sense, what were your best books? Who were your best teachers? If they want to get better educated, besides the standard experience of 20 years investing in the markets, what would you recommend? Do you recommend a couple of websites, a couple of books, a couple of authors? Uh, how would you recommend them to improve their investment, especially in your case, let's say, stock market investment skills? What, 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 what's your recommendation? Well, first of all, as I mentioned at the beginning, I am an engineer. I, okay. I learn about finance and stock markets zero at university. Okay, I, so I, you I, didn't get brainwashed. That's an advantage. Yeah. So, so basically, everything I know, I learn by either reading or by doing. Okay. Right? So, which were the books? And uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I have read a lot about uh, stock market investments, and. Um, off the top of my head, I would say that the best book that uh, I would recommend to anyone uh, to read, and because this is, you know, in that, that book elaborates a system that works and that has worked over decades and meaning investing or make, trading system. Make, make money to make money uh -huh. basically to make money if trading. your objective is to make money in the stock market the book has a very simple name which is uh, uh, how to make money in stocks by uh, William O'Neill who is the founder of uh, investors business daily uh, a okay. publication in the US uh, which is also worth a while subscri subscribing to um, so that, that for me is the number one book. If you read that on book trading. On, on trading, on, on stock market invest, investing. Investing, okay, yeah. in general. What, what about other sources? Where, where else, uh, what else you value in your general uh, investing background? Is it learning, ex except the 20 years of experience again. Yeah, so I have become what, what a... What authors, what, which authors you have highest respect for or investors? Who? you like, who you follow? I, I would say that uh, more than authors, um, these days what I have learned to value a lot is, uh, believe it or not, uh, Twitter. Okay. I, 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 never, I was never interested in Twitter until I became a more active uh, investor in the stock market because Twitter has a, an amazing community of uh, traders and investors mm -hmm. which uh, share their views in, in Twitter so after some time you you know you, you start following the right kind of people and and then you get uh, very stimulating inputs from from them mm -hmm. in the sense of uh, you know investment ideas investment principles investment philosophies so uh, you know if you follow people like Ray Dalio that you mentioned for okay. instance and then look at who follows him or who he follows, uh, then you very quickly get into a, a, a huge... Uh, a good network. A network of, of, uh, of very good investors that mm -hmm. have a strong track record and knowing what they do is very instructive. Mm -hmm. What about general lessons, investing lessons you've learned over the last 20 years, what these might be? Or general advice to you know, uh, relatively younger uh, investors. Yeah. So one thing that I learned the hard way, uh, because I made a lot of mistakes, uh, basically with my own money and, 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 and all painful made. mistakes uh, of you know losing your money. Uh, I think that has you know that has the great advantage of, of giving you knowledge, giving you the experience of having gone through it, and, and that's something that you will never forget. Yeah. Right? Getting burned. Yeah, getting burned. There is a very strong tendency in human beings to basically uh, cash on winners mm -hmm. quickly and let losers run. run. When in, in actual fact, so that there is a, an entire uh, psychological underpinning to that that shows why we act the way we act and why we as human beings have evolved to being 
risk averse and, 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 and do exactly the opposite of what you should be doing in the stock market, namely to very quickly cut your losses yes. and to let your winners run. Right. And so my, my own experience, you know, I, I usually invest in about half of the companies I invest in, I make mistakes. But what I've learned over time is that if I cut my losses quickly, I end up losing much less money okay. on those that I have made a mistake than the money I make in those that I that I uh, that I, I was right to invest in. So so so, so basically, uh, w uh, the process of learning was to learn to cut losses quicker and to learn to let and ride the profits longer. Correct. And shift. Okay, that's good enough. Okay. Any final uh, thoughts to conclude? No, I think it was it was a great conversation. I'm looking forward Thank to you. this. Thank you very much. Hopefully, we'll repeat soon. Bye bye.